So welcome everyone. Our speaker today is uh, Go Wei Wei, who will be talking about persistent topological Laplacians. Please, stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and also thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to report our work. So, Yeah, I, I, my talk is intended to be elementary, so people, not only for experts, but also for people from other domains, in, in biology, uh, physical science, engineering. So that's why I try to talk in the way, uh, start like a topology, try to say uh, it's a, like an earlier time, like Euler. Uh, and then you have a famous uh, seven bridge problems. Uh, there's a lot of contribution from other people in later on. And also the last to mention things about the Nobel Prize in the physics, uh, low, about a low dimension of topology, just uh, 2016. Uh, so when we work on the topology, uh, so we probably use the topological environment. Uh, one of the most popular topological environment is uh, Betty Lambert. But in addition, we could have other things like genus number and all the characteristics, things like that. Uh, so, so Betty Lambert is turned out to be some of the most important uh, uh, <clears throat> topological environment. Um, actually, it's very simple. I mean, basically, Betty zero is a number of kinetic components. Uh, Betty Betty one is a number of cycles, and Betty two is a uh, uh, cavities. I mean, loosely speaking, this is the way. So basically, if you have uh, something, for example, you have a cycle day. So your battery, everything is connected, battery zero to one, and then yeah, there's an internal number of a cycle, your battery two. So battery two actually is also one, but there's a low thing about cavity, so it's, it's, so it's battery two is zero. And if you think about a Tory, this is a very important topological subject. So you actually battery zero is one, everything is connected, and then battery one is two because you have a two independent cycle over there, you see. And then your battery two is one because the inside is input. I mean, this is a pretty simple, right? So 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 but I, however, since it's too simple, probably it has limitation. And one of the limitations is something so-called a topological joke. So people say uh, topologists, they cannot distinguish uh, between a, a, a mug and a muffin, something like that. I mean, this is actually from a computation point of view and for application point of view also, it has a lim such a limitation. Uh, so next stage on the whole thing, change the dynamics is something so-called process homology is induced by filtration. So basically the, we wanted to start with a simplicial geometry or things like that, we we'll talk about it. Uh, discrete points. So uh, one point, one point is one zero simplest, and then the edge is one simplest, so on and so forth. And in a such a way, we have a building block in terms of something so called uh, uh, <coughs> simplicial complex, and then use such things as an element for a group. And you have a you have a chain group things like that. Uh, and then on that, we have a technique so-called boundary operator, uh, such that it just systematically get around one of the, of the, uh, of the points over there, out of there, and then see what is the, the rest of the group. Uh, so we got a cyclo group, boundary group, harmonic group, but the point is about a harmonic group because harmonic group, the dimension, is give, give us a computationally, give us the Betty number. So, I mean, a manager group by itself has a lot of more information than just the battery number, but to, from an application point of view, the battery number is something we're looking for. So that's why that's why the, the rank of the harmonic group is important. And a lot of people contributed that. I'm sorry, I cannot put this in the, all the limbs here. Definitely so many as put all the day. And but this is still in the it's still just like a topology, right? So what is really make a difference is a filtration. So you actually create a filtration. You create a, a family, infinite member, infinite member of a family of the different geometry, a different geometries, and from there you have a group. Uh, you have a you have a you have a homology. So in such a way, you actually 
bridge the gap between the geometry and the topology. I don't want to get into the uh, theoretical detail here. Uh, I think most people ask per. So I just want to give an example to see uh, what is going on. So this is topological data analysis based on the persistent homology. So basically you have a increased radius, you see the battery number. So, so there's one battery number disappear for this particular data. And there's the other one disappear, doesn't move any further. So in this way, you actually create a scenes uh, uh, for the battery, at, at least for the battery zero, you see they are keeping actually the number of battery zero keep decreasing. Uh, on this side, you have a simplest, and you can see just almost we are going to have like a, a, a cycle here. So that means my battery one is going to have something. Yeah, right, I got something for battery one. And then I get the other one for battery one. There are two cycles over there. And then you can realize even this is keep increasing, this is going to be a disappear, this one. So you're going to see this bar is going to be just a stop moving, right? Uh, yeah. You know, in one second is going to stop. So yeah, okay. So this is stop moving and you get the last one is keep it going until the whole thing is finished. You know, there's a no thing here and then you got become a topologically true. So in this case, we basically have a topological fingerprint for this things. How can we use this things for practical application? So basically we just use this fingerprint representation for complex things like a protein. Alpha helix, beta sheet, and uh, those things are uh, uh, very, very complicated uh, protein structure elements. So I'll just look at the carbon, uh, the, the C alpha carbon, the alpha carbon atoms over there for the alpha helix. So you see, I have four those type of elements. I just think about increasing my radius at one particular point that they disappear, become everything is just become one. But also at one particular point, you see there's a battery one, there's something show up. And if I increase one more, put one more uh, C alpha atoms over there, you can see there's one more light come up. And also you have upper four, you have a one. And the lower four, you have other one in terms of battery one. So you can systematically do that for very complicated subject. You know? uh, and then even much more complicated, like a beta battery, you can get a topologic fingerprint. And even much more complicated, this is the meanings of atoms in this uh, microtubules or out there. We still get a topological representation for that. So, so this is the idea, right? So, but uh, this is uh, something everybody <laughs> knows about this stuff. So what I try to say today is uh, try to say, okay, can, can we actually use it for more complicated data, like a uh, protein folding? That's a very important problem in the, in the biology. Uh, the answer is yes. Our original dimension is extremely high. It's 3n plus 1, but n is about 5,000 in a normal case. And we just reduce this to the two dimension. You see, this is uh, to the R2. So this is the radius. This is uh, I have three, I have three panels, battery 0, battery 1, battery 2, you see? Until they don't move, I got it. Finally, I got this two-dimensional representation with a three panel. Uh, so this is my representation goes from uh, something about uh, 15,000 of dimension go to 2D. Now, the question is, can, is this thing useful for real biological data, right? So we needed to answer that, such a question in the rest of my talk. So. My, my actually, my answer is actually, this is not enough. I mean, actually, we need something more. So we, that's why I wanted to talk about persistent uh, homology, the limitations. So what are the limitations? So the first thing is uh, it cannot handle the heterogeneous information. For example, you have a different type of objects in the data, right? So, so for example, people in the room, you have a, you, you have a, you have a, female, you have a male, you have an adult, you have children, those are the things, they are, they are different type of things. That's not a built into this topological point cloud representation. Uh, the next thing we wanted, we wanted to say is, uh, is uh, it's actually quite a, a qualitative instead of a quantitative. For example, file numbering in the, in the biology is very important, but actually, uh, so it's so much different from six numbering, but in terms of uh, Personal homology, they count just the same thing. They don't distinguish different numbers in the ring. So that's, a, so that's, so that's the other thing. 
And one more thing is uh, this low topological changes, uh, like homotopic evolution, they cannot be seen. I will show you example to see what I tried to say about this. So because, I mean, this is obvious because uh, person homology to try to see the topologic change, right? But if there's something geometric change, but, uh, but it doesn't have a topo contribute to the topological change, and then person homology cannot see that. And the next thing I would say is, uh, is cannot deal with the like a directed ladder work or digraphs. So this is things very important, like a polarization, uh, regulation, control issue, and always we have a direct graph. In such a case, the things we talk here, person homology by itself doesn't deal with that things. And also we can have a, is, is, we can have things like a structured data, like a hypergraph or direct ladder work. And those things are structured data you see here, oh, everywhere, right? For example, you have a you have you 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 have you have a G20 or a G7 and uh, Brickus country. Those things are the organizations, right? So they have a certain structure in the in the different countries. And so those things are a lot of reflect in the person homology. So I'm trying to actually we have needed to uh, address these limitations in order to make it working. So that's the point from practical point of view. So, so the first thing I would like to say is something we call uh, persistence uh, core homology. Core homology allow us actually to address the problem you see. I mean, this is uh, uh, it's not so complicated compounds over there, but it has, it has uh, the, the work oxygens, nitrogens, uh, carbons, uh, hydrogen, different type of atoms. You want to, because those different type of atoms, they are actually so important for the property. So that's why we need to embed this information into topology. As a result, we actually come up with things like colorful barcode. So the barcode, each bar actually can have a different color. So that means they have come out from different uh, uh, different type of atoms. And in this way, you can see I have a data one, data two, data three. Data one, data two, geometrically similar, but their color wise is different, right? So you have a different property, different uh, uh, individual uh, on the data set. And the data three, the, the shape is different, but the color wise, this one somehow is uh, somehow is similar to that guy. So in this way, we actually come up with a colorful barcode for all of them. So we actually do that. With a uh, with a protein and use this method, and then we can make it working. Otherwise, just use the person homology for the whole protein. Uh, it actually doesn't really tell you too much information. And in this case, we actually make it working very well. And we actually tried to in order to make this work very well, we have uh, used something like an optimum transport. Uh, we have a Wasserstein curve. So that means at one uh, part is. Uh, the difference in the uh, long geometric information. So that means a different color of atom. And, uh, and then you also have a difference in the geometric information. So you got Wasserstein curve in this way. Uh, use this as a measure. And then you put this things into the uh, machine learning to make it working, right? This is uh, what we do. Uh, and this is one technique and also cumulative graph. And Sorry, this is could, I, could I have a quick question here? Is it, when you say it's colored, are you saying that you split your point cloud into two different point cloud that is corresponding to different atoms and apply persistence homology on individual point cloud? I mean, that's a very good question. That's one way to do it. We call the element of specific uh, persistence homology. Uh, but I'm talking here is a, is a core homology. I just use the whole thing together. But I, but I do uh, in terms of, I build up a, a space or a functional space on each atoms. And such as that, I put a different property, put it over there. So, so okay, I, I, guess, I guess, let me think about this way. You have, a, you have a, in the previous slide, you have a blue point cloud from one atom. You have a red point cloud from another atom. Uh, you are computing person's homology of the blue point cloud person's homology of the red point cloud and person's homology of the union of the point cloud. Uh, that's a lot of way I'm talking about that, 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 that one. But that's also the other method we could element the specific person homology. We did a lot of things like that, as you talk about. But here I'm saying is a persistent core homology. Everything is just one point cloud. But 
I, ah, I see. Poor homology allow me to identify different type of property on each different uh, simplex. Yeah, so this is two. I mean, what you said is correct. We have a paper on that, but this one is different. Yeah. This okay. Just use the core harmonic, just one. It's one point cloud. But uh, allow me to differentiate uh, different type of atoms there, right? Okay, cool. So, Thank so, you. So, so the next one I try to say is a complicated graph. I mean, this is not our work. There's a lot of people uh, on this uh, work on that. You see, I mean, the earliest paper I can find out is, is uh, actually Ackerman. In the 1944, he's actually, we have a graph Laplacian. He actually put a simplicial complex into the graph Laplacian. From that on, there's a lot of papers, a lot of people work on that. I mean, the idea is very similar. You have a simplicial complex stuff structure, and then you have a chain group, uh, and then you have a boundary operator. But from here, you don't go further uh, to get things uh, like a cycle group, things like that. You actually use uh, the join the boundary group. Uh, to form uh, uh, something so-called uh, combinatorical Laplace. I mean, this is uh, this is a way to has been people doing that for a long time, right? And then finally, you can recover the Betty number by basically is a kernel of the of the Laplace operator. Uh, so what we did is we actually put the persistence uh, 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 version of this. So we put a filtration, introduce a filtration to that. And uh, I just tried to argue why this method is a little bit better than person homology. I, I got a point in the cloud. It's very simple, just a six points over there, right? So initially, my, my topological, uh, so my harmonic spectrum of my topological Laplacian is the same, just like an like original person homology. And you can see these blue ones are the person homology. This is a, like a barcode, things like that. And this is a battery one, you see that. But however, if you if you do that, you see at this point, you see the things disappear because they uh, have a cycle to come up. And then this from that on, you actually have a battery one. So so yeah, and the battery one disappear at this point. And if you go further, so when you go further, you see the connectivity is increasing here. This is something I refer as a homotopic, homotopic shape evolution. So this is a shape evolution doesn't change the topology, but it does But however, you look at it, just look at the first long zero eigenvalue of this Laplacian operator. So that's the red one, the, the, the lambda. So the Betty lambda I still use this uh, blue one. So you see this one. So this is long zero eigenvalue, the long harmonic spectrum of the top uh, persistence Laplacian, they record all the uh, topological change, right? But also the record what? They were record the so-called shape evolution, homotopic uh, shape evolution. That's why it has extra information. So this is why this method is more powerful because it can detect a lot of uh, homotopic shape evolution uh, that cannot be detected by person homology. So actually, we also try to do things uh, like uh, persistent path Laplacian. And certainly, you have a version of persistent path homology. Uh, Fakani, they did that part, right? So actually, you can see here, uh, this, these two things, they are so different, right? But if you look at it, they are, uh, look at the persistent uh, um, <coughs> path homology. Persistent path homology, the blue guys here, they don't. They have don't have any difference, you know. But you look at a uh, look at a person's past Laplacian, and you so that would be the red one. The red ones they do have a difference, you know. Uh, so so those one, this red one is different from that one. But this blue one is the same as the blue one. So that means the person's past homology, they actually cannot detect a lot of uh, uh, things change over there, right? But a person's Laplacian show you the difference of this one. This is obviously different from that guy. So that's how you see to black, uh, person's Laplacian, they actually uh, pass Laplacian, they actually able you to, first they able you to deal with something like a directed graph. Uh, other things that they actually can give you more information compared to the person's past homology. So let's see, is, uh, we actually also did something so-called persistent sheep Laplace, sheep Laplace. So this one, the major uh, interesting things for this is enabled you to 
actually embedded physical laws like Columbus law uh, in the point cloud or in the topological representation. So you see, this is a, a point cloud, but the point cloud are labeled with some uh, like a partial charge or well, different description of a different each point have a different assignment. So in such a way, uh, I can I can look at this things. Uh, at this point, you see, this is a, at this point you have a cycle. You still have a compare with the uh, shift homology. You can get something like that. So so this is point. This blue ones are the battery number change. Uh, if you go further, so at this point you see, so the battery number is disappear. The battery one disappear. You see here, but if you look at the comparison. This so you have a blue one is a person homology. And the green one, green one is the person's Laplacian, and then the red one is the person's shift Laplacian. So you see the also this is the difference of persons Laplacian and the person's shift Laplacian. But the, both the Laplacian here, they're able to pick up things, <coughs> the homotopic uh, shape evolution. So that means every connection is counted. But that's the connection is not counted in the person homology, or even the person's uh, sheep homology. So that's the point I tried to make. Uh, and then we can go further so to deal with things like a structured data, we can have a hypergraph. For, for hypergraph in such a way, you can have a still at the six points, but at this point actually you have a different type of, uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> So a uh, different type of property assignment. So you have internal organizations. In this case, you see, uh, you can see the battery, battery, battery zero uh, at this point, you see they, they actually goes from five. I mean, originally six point, but only recognize battery zero, only recognize five. So from five, go down to something like, uh, 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 go down to two, yeah. Uh, and then you can you go further. It's go it's go going down, going at this point going down to actually going down to one something like that. But the battery one and the battery zero, they you don't see anything. However, you look at the Laplacian part, the long harmonic part, the long harmonic uh, of the spectrum. So so you can see the first the long uh, the, the lambda zero or lambda one lambda two you see they are jumps all the day so that means this type of a technique they are able to pick up things uh, typically those type of uh, uh, would say process uh, hyper graph homology kind of pick up this is comparison this is blue line this is green line is process hyper graph homology. So the Laplacian is the actual information is this red one, right? But of course, this is part of the green ones also just in the harmonic spectrum of this Laplacian operator. So, I mean, we can go further, deal with the directed and also structured data. So we have a persistent hyper diagram. You can say also a persistent directed hypergraph, a Laplacian. So in this case, you can see uh, I mean, we see similar type of uh, behave. So basically the difference is uh, uh, battery one actually can have uh, some change. Earlier, battery one doesn't have any change for this similar geometry. So this is basically, I finished uh, most of my talks about the Laplacian part. And the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, differential geometry. Uh, I certainly I go from uh, elementary, so historically there's a, uh, People make a contribution over the like Rangin, and they, but this is the things very particularly interesting. You can see just observation. You have from virus to bacteria to a drop of water and to the solid system. You see, they all favor this shape. The reason for that is what universally we have a very important problem all the day. It's a minimum surface. So it's a surface minimization such that it stabilizes the system. So surface stabilized system can be in a different geometry you can for, formulate uh, as a uh, surface energy. So, so that's uh, you give, give the surface tension times the surface error. And the surface error in the geometric <coughs> representation, it basically is a gradient of a shape function. And this shape function is simple. If you have a drop of oil, so this is one, and outside in the water is zero. 
So this is the shape function, and in the middle you have a you have a continuous change out of gate, right? So in this way, you just do the old Lagrangian evaluation. You got uh, something so called uh, Laplace Bartholomew flow, but actually after evaluation, oh, first thing you got is mean coach representation, a generalized mean coach representation. And this is a elliptical problem. You can change it to a, a parabolic problem to find a solution. So that's how we get Laplace Bartholomew flow. And we've been doing that for a long time ago. So this is a, a you generate a protein surface, whereas the surface or well, non-structure surface, where like the surface compared to the other surface representation, right? Uh, by the way, actually go step further from a differential geometry point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. So so-called the Durant Hodge theory uh, and also exterior uh, uh, discrete exterior calculus. A lot of mathematicians work on this domain. So basically, this means uh, you have an arbitrary uh, fee, vector field can be decomposed in the harmonic and the part, non harmonic part. You have a curvature free, divergent free. And this is related to a lot of physical models I don't want to get into. But this certainly is a part of a differential geometry. Uh, you have a, a different forms uh, zero form, one form, two form, and they are dual representation. In the vector calculus, you can see those are the gradients, that's in the 3D. Uh, curve and uh, divergent things like that. So what we did, we basically did things, uh, come up with this type of representation and for Corellium. So it's about, it's a very important technique in the biology and uh, we get the Corellium analysis by using the Ron Hardy theory, right? So, so basically I talk so far, I talk about algebra topology. I also talk about the filtration, that's a multi scale analysis. Uh, so in the middle, so since you combine, you get a persistent homology, uh, and then you have a different geometry, right? So different geometry between different geometry algebra topology, like the Ron Hodge Laplace or the Ron Hodge theory. So and then also between these two, you have something so called a manifold convergence. Uh, and what is in the middle? What in the middle we call it? Evolution of the Durant Hodge theory. I mean, the idea is very simple. You just combine these three things together. So, this is the things, for example, this is a, you have a lot of uh, like a, uh, like a beam bears, things like that. They don't have a topological change, but they are changing in the shape, right? Size, things like that. So, this is a, like uh, you actually do a manifold filtration. So, manifold filtration actually give you a series of subjects, they have a similar shape. Uh, and they don't necessarily have a topological change. So in this way, we just uh, use the things uh, to get a, like a filtration induced around hard complex. So, so, so that's something I don't want to get into detail, but the idea is this things, uh, let's see why it's useful. We still construct the hard Laplacian, right? But it's the evolution of hard Laplacian with like things like a consistency, things like that. So uh, with a different dimension K, right? See things like that. So you can see, I mean, this is a, a point, right? This is actually a, a, a benzene a compounds. It got 12 points here. So initially this one, and for this one, they connect here, right? So you can see this is connected. And then you see battery, number battery zero change from 12 to six. Uh, and also this, is, this blue one is my, uh, my topology, okay? Uh, it's a battery, it's a battery. And then my, the red one is my long harmonic spectrum, first long harmonic spectrum. You see the long harmonic spectrum keep it uh, actually to record such a change. Uh, but you see, uh, this is uh, going from here to here, you actually have a cycle in this case, you see, you have a battery one come up. And uh, in this case, uh, the spectrum part, the long zero uh, eigenvalue part also have a jump at this point. Uh, but from, from here to here, uh, you don't see uh, any further any further change. This is evolution, but my uh, spectrum part keep changing. You know, the long harmonic spectrum part keep changing. That means this have a more information. So, so from here to here, actually, is a topological persistence because it's changing. So you can see things like that. Uh, it has a jump corresponding to that. So this is a good for one. This is good for one metric data. Remember, person homology or Laplace, I talked a moment, a moment ago, that's for the point cloud data. This is for one metric data. You can use, a, you can use a evolution of the Durant-Hardy Laplace. 
So basically, I finished my mathematical part. Now, uh, I try, try to show you why we try to develop the things. I mean, the reason we develop things is because we always look at practical problems. We, for example, this is uh, something so-called disreact uh, grand challenge. So it's a worldwide competition in the computer and drug discovery. So drug design. And we participate in the cluster competition. We actually use person homology and actually is element specific person homology or person co homology. We use that technique to, uh, to participate in that. And actually, you see, this seems like a gold scene. That means we actually the best out of there. So this is actually for 2016. And then we also next, like 2017, we got a lot of like a gold color stuff. So we are best on a lot of topics. And then in the in the in the grand challenge four, we actually get a gold medal on all different issues out of there, except for the ones we didn't participate. Uh, the reason we didn't participate is because this actually at, a, at the competition, they initially didn't announce this type of things. But later on, they added this to, to the competition. We don't know that. So, so those are the people that were actually, you see the people here like a Dak and also Zixian, they are uh, just a mathematical background because they have a wonderful technique, uh, TDA. So you were able, you were able as to actually become a number one in a, such a competition. And, so uh, the rest, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about, uh, use a few minutes to talk about uh, the SARS-CoV-2. You remember the competition was before the pandemics. So at the pandemics, my whole group actually, most of my group moved to this uh, most important problem. Well, look at SARS-CoV-2, you look at this one. So the five day average of the number of cases, right? So you can see there's a peak sort of this. This is a alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and this is the Omicron, and the beta, beta 2, and the beta 4, beta 5. So you can see those are the few peaks. Uh, actually, the total story, how the things, uh, how the pandemics have evolution out of there, right? So, so our question is, what is the evolution the mechanism for that? So to do that, we actually do mutation track. So mutation track, we check the whole genome, you know, for, for this virus. It's just about 10,000 uh, uh, amino acid for the whole genome. So we look at the mutation. So each dot here means one mutation. And the height here means what? Means they are, this is a number of frequency, number of times we see that. So it's in the lecture log scale, okay? So this is like a millions of times we actually see that. And we actually found out almost uh, 29,000 of the single mutations. Uh, and then out of uh, three, almost 4 million of the patient data, we track this change. But this is just gave us this uh, impression. It's so complicated a problem. I mean, this doesn't tell you how to look into this problem. Doesn't, from any perspective, not to mention about the TDA. Just any perspective in the in the physical in the biology domain, right? So what we need to do is we actually so what given the transmission and the evolution that's very important at the during the pandemic. We wanted to know that everybody tried to know that. So my team also tried to know that. Tried to get a little bit of molecular understanding. So basically, the mutation is the evolution uh, determine the virus how they change from one one to other one. So it's basically random. So random genetic shift and uh, such random things is built up in all kinds of different things. I don't want to get into detail. This is a part of a molecular biology, uh, but also not only molecular level, you have this problems, but also you have a organ level, organism level. Organism level, you have host like a human uh, gene editing, and also you can have a recombination. So that's a human gene combined with virus gene, things like that. Uh, and also at the population level, right? You want to look at all the population, what is happening over there? And we got a mechanism, so-called natural selection. Now, we have so many different things. Which one dominate? Which one play most important role? So that's a question to be answered. So at the early stage of a pandemic, people don't have a very good idea about that. So we actually tried to analyze these things from a biology point of view, say this is a virus, right? You got a spike protein, membrane proteins, uh, some other protein. And this, this blue line is the cell, human uh, 
a membrane cell, right? So inside here is the inside cell. This is a in the blood, outside cell. The virus try to get inside our cell. So after they get into cell, they release virus material and who have all kinds of uh, uh, biological chemical process. I don't want to get into detail, but actually the big picture is the virus tried to assemble a new virus and then get out of the cell and try to infect the other host or other cell. So that's what virus want to do, you know? That's how they can maintain their species to survive. So this is a, almost like a mechanics process. But the whole thing is so complicated. In the next 50 years, nobody is going to have all the information about what is happening here. So, so but what we can do, what, how to make sense out of that? What we did is try to look at the things. This is the interaction, the spike protein, this yellow guy, with the human protein, this ACE2. ACE2 is a very important protein in our body for like them, for example, try to balance our pressure, things like that. So it's responsible for things like hypertension. Uh, so whatever. So why does it take advantage by the, to this guy and then get inside? So that means this step is really, really important. Spike protein interaction with ACE2 is the crucial step. Without this step, virus just stay with some other things, don't get into human. They can infect the human because they found out this protein take advantage of that, okay? So, and what we did is actually use a person homology, uh, topology, uh, and uh, use actually element specific topology to deal with this type of work. At the early stage, we actually found out uh, two important residue, uh, or so called uh, on the spike protein 452 and 501. We said in at that time, we said we predict uh, a few residues on the receptor binding domain. Uh, and then we point out 452 and 501, along with three others, have a high chance to mutate into significantly more infectious uh, correlating species. So, how good? I mean, that was the early stage, uh, actually, in the summer of 2020. So this is what we know nowadays, okay? So alpha, beta, gamma, delta, everything you know, all the different variants, you got 501, 501, 501, 452 in the delta, 452. You see, basically, we predicted this things long before this variance occur. Uh, because the first one occurred in the November or December of 2020, that's a half a year later after the operation. And the only kinds, or basically two years later, and it, it has even everything happened now, most important variant out of the, they actually have the two uh, mutation site we predict use a person homology. So that's a story. This is a something, it's part of a history for this pandemic. So we actually go further. We actually discover the mechanism of virus transmission and the evolution. So what we did is basically look at the, uh, like a mutation on the spike protein, right? And then look at those mutations. Some of those ones actually make the binding stronger. Some of the ones make the binding weaker. The ones that make the binding stronger, they become more, make the virus more infectious. And we realize actually, this is the frequency we see that. And this is the time, and that's the early, you see, this is because we published this in the, in the June, whatever. So you can see the ones that make OS more infectious, but make the binding, the protein protein binding uh, stronger. Otherwise, they have a higher chance so, to be absorbed. So that implies this actually gives us a evidence with the molecular model and the genetic analysis among those population we actually found out natural selection with a molecular model. So we actually say that natural selection favors those mutations that enhance virus transmission. So this is something uh, we found out that the first mechanism for this virus evolution uh, with statistical support. Otherwise, everybody knows, you know, I mean, even Darwin, he said that natural selection, but for a particular virus, uh, how, how the natural selection happened you need a molecular model, uh, biophysicist understanding plus uh, like a machine learning plus topology, try to analyze the whole thing and combine with, uh, with the patient data. We actually found other things uh, like a vaccine breakthrough mutation as a different mechanism. How we did it, we still look at the top of mutations, you know, we look at the uh, top of 50 mutations and we found out that there's a 
is uh, since are the ones they have a very higher frequency, the ones they are the ones they actually have a uh, make the binding free energy change, make it more efficient. So that's uh, it's good for that pattern, right? Correlation. Because this whole thing, I have 600 mutations or uh, mutations over there. I only look at a top of 50 mutations. But among this top of 50 mutations, I got one thing over there, very strange. So this one particular mutation, they don't make the virus biting stronger. You know, they are biting energy actually change going down a lot. This is uh, something, it's uh, something cannot be explained by our first mechanism. So what, and then we did something. We did uh, uh, something, we actually look at 135 different antibodies. And those antibodies also bias to this spike protein. And then we look, we realize actually this 135 antibody bias to the mutation actually, uh, actually seriously impacted by this particular mutation. So that means the just antibodies is, is either produced from our body to protect us, right? So, but our actually this mutation uh, actually they actually destroy those antibody. So, so that means the number here. So that means that among 135, 85 of them become uh, actually weaken a lot. So ineffective those antibody. So and this gives us a second mechanism. We actually uh, have this molecular model, but we also have what uh, we also have the genetic uh, population analysis. We realize actually this is associated with what with the first uh, vaccination. So uh, at a 2021, so only industrialized country like Denmark or US and UK, and we look at analyze all different countries. They actually have a vaccination. We realize uh, they have one dose of vaccination, two dose of vaccination. Those slides are actually uh, correlates strongly with the this particular. Uh, with this particular uh, uh, mutation. So in this way, we actually found the second uh, uh, mechanism for virus uh, actually evolution. So that's a so-called uh, antibody resistance mutations. So uh, after that, we also did a few work. Uh, basically, we actually predict uh, the BA2. You see, the title of this paper is says, uh, BA2 uh, have a high potential become the legs dominate virus. To do that, we have to say not only dominate, we also say this is lax dominate. And that's actually in the February 10 of 2022. Uh, so actually what happened later on, so this is from a, a WHO number. You can see BA2 uh, later on, uh, we actually made a prediction something along here when BA2 population is really small, but later on they really become dominant at this point. Everything is basically BA2. Uh, so, so this is a, uh, so you can see this is a BA2 color here. So you can see this is a, our prediction user topology actually is a, actually go ahead of time. And actually we gave this information to CDC and uh, uh, also uh, NIH who told them this is what is going to happen. So, and the last thing we did actually, we said, remember I've, in the early I said, personal Laplacian, we switched the model to personal Laplacian to do a better prediction. And we actually project, project the Omicron BA4, BA5 to become a new dominating variant. And that's actually May 1st, 2022. So what happened later on? So you can see the statistics from WHO. So this is the time we made a prediction. We said this guy is going to become a dominator, right? So, but later on, you see in the, in the June, uh, actually, later June, uh, early July, it become a dominant. So, so that means we actually made other accurate prediction out of there, right? So, I think I'm running out of time. I just want to say this is how we did it with patient data, virus, and sequencing. We take over this patient data and get virus and sequence over there from guy side, and then we do uh, genome typing, and then we look at uh, uh, mutation on spike protein. And we build up a model, molecular model here. And then we use a put, put whole thing into topological barcode, things like that. And we use a convolution, the deep learning, things like that to predict uh, the binding energy. So that's how we did it, the things, right? And these are the people I don't want, because I'm a little bit over time, I don't want to get into more detail. Now I would like to happy to have your question. Thank you very much. Before we go into the 
question round, I would say let's give the speaker a round of applause. Uh, please unmute and then clap. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there are there any public questions that you want to have in the recording? Please unmute yourself and then and speak. Or I can also read some some questions out. Maybe I'm going to start because we have one in the chat, namely, did you use persistent Laplacians in the COVID related analysis? Yeah, that's true. My last slide is showing that we use a persistent Laplacian to project the actually very accurately two months ahead about the COVID, right? So that's actually given people like a government or CDC and the drug de uh, vaccine design company ahead of time to design to get it prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 really that's really amazing. I have a if if the person oh yeah okay the person who asked this is already happy with this response but I have a follow up maybe uh, in in general about persistent Laplacian. So the way I understand this is that you can build them alongside the filtration, but is it, are there any, let's say, are there any type of theorems like in persistent homology where you, where you can get the full representation along the filtration by just doing one pass? Or is it more, do, do you have to, to, to pick your resolutions more carefully and then calculate different, different stages of that persistent plus and hope, hope that makes sense? I, basically, um, it's used in a similar way as person homology, but it's just mm -hmm. give you a little bit more information, uh, particularly uh, long topological information. The shape evolution over there can be recorded. Actually, mathematical analysis done by uh, Russo, uh, Wang, and uh, Faconi, uh, I mean, they have a paper about those analysis mathematics. They have uh, two papers come out, actually. There's also one more paper. They publish one. I think in the, my talk, I already put a name over there. I didn't read it out because of the time constraint. Mm -hmm. They did a mathematic. I'm quite sure there's a lot more to analyze. Uh, it's really a, a little bit, a real, really, a, this type of Laplace is more powerful method compared to uh, person homology. Certainly, person mm -hmm. homology also you have a lot of other developments for sure. But uh, this is a simple way, cheaper way to get some more, uh, more information about your system. Mm -hmm. well, I absolutely, absolutely agree with this. I, I think it's it's fascinating. I'm I'm following this very, very closely because I think it's it's a fascinating way. Do we have any other yeah, there's questions? A question there, quite a quite a few more. So Bay, maybe Bay, you go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh so I was wondering, you showed um the plots, which I think that that's really amazing result when you showed persistence homology curve versus persistence uh, sort of Laplacian curve. And then you also showed the sheaf Laplacian. So my question is, what is the, you know, if in terms of information content, it appears that the uh, persistent Laplacian has a lot of a lot of information. You also show sheaf Laplacian. Is there any notion which one has more information between the uh sort of shift Laplacian, yeah, this is a picture, right? So you have the persistence Laplacian versus persistence shift Laplacian. This seems to be react to a similar line of signal. Is there any idea between- There's, there's a difference here. Yeah, this, yeah. Is the, this is a shift, right? Shift is a red one. Yeah. But that yeah. didn't capture this one, you see? The, I mean the. I oh, mean, oh, I see. Okay. The homology, the homology part. Of the, I mean, I mean, homology part. Of they captured this one, but in the first uh, long zero frequency part, they didn't capture this one. But the Laplacian actually captured. You see, yeah. So, yes. are you? Is there like a hypothesis that persistent Laplacian has slightly more information than persistent? I I cannot say that. This okay. is, we need a lot of more detailed mathematical analysis, but the point is, uh, shift uh, Laplacian allow you to actually embed in different atom types there. So that's a question you asked earlier. So yeah. you can have similar to the core homology, percent core homology embedded. You can embed a different type of atom, a different type of people in the point cloud into the shift representation. So I put it here actually embed the physical law because we actually did that. So it's just a Coulomb's law we embed it into the sheep Laplacian. Okay, all right, thank you. 
I have a I have a follow up. Um, I'm sorry, there's I don't want to don't want to steal anyone. Oh no, there's there's more questions. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see those hands. Okay, then I'm not going to follow up, and someone else does. Please go ahead. Can I maybe? So, yeah, Ness, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, because actually, um, this slide is very uh, pertinent to my question. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, what is exactly um what you're displaying here in this slide? Um, in the red lines, is this, is this the eigenvalue, like some eigenvalue of the Laplacian, maybe? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is the, the lowest, lowest or... the long zero eigenvalue. The zero okay. eigenvalue would be the same as a Pursuit homology, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the long zero eigenvalue, the first one. Okay. Should, the second one, and the first more, you can have more information, right? Exactly. So you could actually like extend this method to other um, eigenvalues as well, right? Oh, yeah, because of the Laplacian allow you to have a diagonalization, you get eigenvalue. Yeah. And then the kernel part or the harmonic part is, is, is really just the same as the person harmonic information, right? A uh, person harmonic barcode representation information, put in that way, <laughs> uh, or, okay. or a Betty, Betty Lambert representation. But a person harmonic by itself in the harmonic actually have more information, but we don't really utilize all of them. I see. And do we have like also like theoretical guarantees that these um, eigenvalues are going to behave in a nice way in the same way that for like persistent homology, we have structure theorems and stuff like that? Good question. Actually, uh, 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 Jen Liu and uh, Jay Wu, they actually recently have a paper about stability of a persistent Laplacian. They just put it in the archive. I already put it here somewhere, you see. Okay. Uh, I see, you see, this is a new uh, and old, and also uh, memory. I see, I see. Yeah, they, they have a papers there and some computation the paper over there. So the methods we propose is a little earlier, uh, 2019, right? So there are a lot of people work on this nowadays. Uh, I see. But, okay. uh, um, but a lot of many people work on something eight, like a pass, there's a mathematical analysis for that person pass Laplacian, it's totally input, I guess. Yeah, and also shift Laplacian is input. But I also put this information here, like a shift information. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, shift Laplacian, you can read things by uh, Robert, right? I see. Thank you very much. It's very, very cool. And the past part, I think I, I forgot to put actually uh, Bacconi's paper, yeah. He, he has a persistent path of homology, right? Yes, yeah, so I had a question, uh, a different topic. So with uh, been reading a lot of your papers about uh, COVID. I was just wondering if anybody's using that to uh, develop uh, vaccines? That's a very good question. You see, uh, because my group, you see, uh, it's entirely in the mathematics. When we work on the COVID initially, uh, most people, they don't believe uh, those are mathematicians, they say. <laughs> so later on, you know, all the way actually discovered quite a very important uh, those type of mechanism out of the, and also did a very accurate prediction. At that point, uh, more people, they are believe what we do, and also CDC, they are very much interested in our methods and ask us for code, things like that. And I, I, I also have a connection with, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, at the beginning, you can see I have a connection with uh, BMS, a British Mass Guido uh, drug design company. They actually develop uh, uh, something, uh, develop an uh, uh, antibody drug and uh, I analyzed their antibody drug and I told them in the very beginning, I said, this antibody is not going to work. Uh, so initially they are a lot of very happy, but now after they lost billions of dollars, they realized what I said is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just have a quick question on um, the, the, on on the molecules and and how what you're studying with persistent Laplacians in general, I think it sounds like because in this case with a biomedical approach, we start with molecules 
and then we run a persistence algorithm or like study the persistent Laplacian on those molecules. I'm wondering if this, if um, in the case where you don't have knowledge that this is some manifold or this is some molecule and you're given a cluster of points, whether you would be able to make a statement about whether those points, like what kind of molecule they are or things like that from the information that you're reclaiming. Because in this case, you're able to compare different molecules, but if you just were given like a like some points, would you what would we be able to what would we able be able to say about um whether those are molecules or what are the comparisons if we didn't start with the assumption that they were molecules to begin with? Oh, I mean that part, uh, I mean if you say a uh, point cloud for people in a room, a uh, point cloud for protein. That, that's, you, you have got to tell people a little bit about background. You say this is the people in the room. But if you already got a lot of different types of proteins out of there, you want to do classification, want to analyze what's the difference, that's an easy, much easier job than what I talk here. So this is, a, this is like a protein-protein interaction molecule. But that part, we, we actually have a paper like uh, 2015, we say topology-based classification of uh, of our proteins, or something like that. So, 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 so that that's part is quite easy actually. But you do need to have a little bit of domain knowledge in order to do a good job. So I don't see any raised hands anymore, but then I'm, I'm very sorry, I didn't want to skip the line, everyone. Uh, I had a question about the, the persistent sheaves as well. Um, I think I might have might have lost this in the presentation, but um, how do you do the, the assignment of, of data actually there? Because that's something that I still have to wrap my head around. This doesn't come come naturally, right? I mean, I understand that you can uh, can do the, the assignments to, to the nodes and, and the edges and so on, but is there is there kind of a canonical choice for for these types of, of assignments, or is that something that that you have to decide for from an application point of view? Yeah, exactly. Like like these these numbers here in in, in this slide. Yeah, this number you can you can get it from a so called a partial charge in the molecular, because in the molecular, a lot of area molecular is equal. I mean, they are very different. So different type of molecular at a different environment they actually have a different partial charge. So that assignment is, is goes through that, right? So, but on the other hand, they say, this is not a point cloud for molecular. You say, this is a point, <laughs> point cloud for people, you see? And then you want to say, okay, some of the number represent a different type of people, things like that, you know, that can be embedded into the uh, shift uh, Laplacian representation, right? So that's basically compared to original, like a uh, person homology. This is she for since actually allow you to incorporate more information into the system, yeah. right? Into topological representation, put in that way. Yeah, yeah I see. Thank you. I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, an exciting sure. paper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do I, I have also, any other question? Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. I also try to say uh, just uh, like a sheaf Laplace. I mean, uh, Robert, they have a lot of work on this. Uh, actually, more than that, I just put one paper. They actually got a paper like trace like 10 years back. Mm -hmm. Out of a mathematical analysis. I, I think our formulation is a little bit different from uh, his, right? But our formulation is already at a stage you can use it as uh, other things like person homology, try to, to explore for many different things. That's very, that's very exciting. So are there any other public questions? Because otherwise I would say, let's give the speaker another round of applause and then I'll move to the, to the um, unofficial section, uh, unofficial questions. Thank you.